Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today I've got another review of subwoofers. This time it is the Monoprice Monolith subwoofers. They come in the 10, the 12, and the 15 inch size, and we're gonna talk about the performance and my subjective opinion and my recommendations in the end. Now out of these subwoofers, the prices are as follows. Currently, $500 for the Monolith 10, $800 for the Monolith 12, and $1,400 for the Monolith 15. And what we're gonna discuss here is the differences in performance as you increase in size. Luckily for me and for you, the feature sets on these subwoofers are all the same between each of the different models. So we'll just look at one model, we'll discuss those features, and then we'll talk about the performance and my subjective thoughts as well. As you can see, the difference in size is quite substantial as you go up from the 10 to the 15 inch. The weight for the 10 inch is around 73 pounds. The weight for the 12 inch is about 100 pounds and the weight for the 15 inch is 128.5 pounds. So these do come with a front port, which helps because normally when you have a rear port, if you put it against a wall, then you're gonna snuff out some of the output capability because that port is being choked off. You don't really have to worry about that in this case, which I like. On the back of the subwoofer, you have its standard set of features, crossover phase level, and then it's EQ switch, crossover switch, auto on off switch. And on the bottom, you have the LFE line unbalanced input. So just standard RCA. Then you have a balanced XLR input and then a XLR pass through. And then you have the master switch. Now let's talk about the top layer, the crossover phase level, and then the uh, flip switches that you've got here. If you want to use your AVR for crossover settings, then you've got the ability to turn the crossover off right here. If you want to use the crossover that's built into the subwoofer, you can turn it on right here, and then you can control it from 40 to 160 hertz. The extended EQ and the THX EQ are both EQ options that you can enable with the subwoofer. I will provide some more in-depth discussion about that later, but for now, basically what you get is THX is less distorted than the extended EQ. However, the extended EQ will provide you a little bit more extension on the very low end. And then you've got the power auto on off switch. Now going to my favorite feature about this subwoofer as far as you know these switches and little features go, you have the phase from zero to 180 degrees, which is variable. Now that's a big deal. Why is that a big deal? Let's say that you've got your subwoofer and your main speaker, a bookshelf, four standard, whatever, and you've got them right next to each other and they are basically aligned perfectly. They're in the same space and they fire at the exact same time. Well, you have good phase matching, good phase, <clears throat> good phase coherency at the crossover point. But that's not typical, that's very atypical, and it's almost impossible in most rooms. So what you normally wind up having physically is a subwoofer placed a few feet away from the main speaker. And when that happens, you get a out of phase alignment. Now you may be able to dial in the time alignment, which is basically to say that you want this speaker and this speaker to arrive at the listener's ear at the same time. That's all well and good. However, that doesn't guarantee that you're gonna be aligned in phase. They are two totally separate things. And what I mean by that is if you have this speaker over here and you have this speaker over here and this one is playing a certain sine wave and it hits you and this one plays a different sine wave and it hits you and let's say they're 180 degrees out of phase. Well, you just flip polarity on the subwoofer. Now they're in phase that creates more SPL, a more cohesive sound, but that's never the case. They're never zero or 180 degrees out of phase. It just doesn't happen like that. Typically, they're gonna be some really odd number, like 45 degrees or 27 degrees or 93 degrees, something weird, right? How do you fix that? You can't use auto EQ in a room because auto EQ software, even direct live, doesn't have the ability to correct for polarity mismatches like that. And, and they even say that in their literature. You have to fix that in the speaker or via physical placement and you just get the best you can. With the ability to control phase variably, you can dial in that phase alignment at the crossover point between the two different speakers quite well. And you can almost get it dead on in most cases. And in doing so, that allows you to have more power, more SPL, more sound arriving at your seated position and the sound waves are in phase. So everything sounds more coherent, more full, more natural, all those nice jazzy buzzwords. Let's take a look at the subwoofer driver itself. Now this particular subwoofer driver is from the 12 inch model, but they all share the same look, the same features. 
So we're just going to take apart this one and give it a look-see. And in this case, what you can see is a cast aluminum basket. You can see some ventilation right here for the upper portion of the voice coil. Now, one thing I did notice, and I wonder if it might cause some issues in long-term output testing, would be the fact that there is no um, pull piece venting here. So uh, that's kind of interesting to me. It's a double stacked ceramic magnet with some little binding post here for you. Pretty thick nitrile surround, I believe. I'm not 100% sure. Um, then you also notice the venting up underneath the cone as well. So there's, there's a good bit of venting. Again, I'm gonna go back to the fact that it doesn't have venting at the pole piece. I'm, I'm curious why that decision was made. I would think that that would help with overall output additional or in addition, but who knows. The spec states it is 18 millimeter X max one way for this 12 inch model. I uh, don't know what the others are, but they're probably all variant of that to some degree. And the other note here is that it also features two aluminum shorting rings, which will also help with the intermodulation distortion. So that's, that's a good thing. That basically helps its maximum output based on distortion as well. Okay, so now that we've talked about a little bit of the feature sets of these different woofers, let's look at the objective data. First, we're gonna start off with the frequency response. So this is not the maximum SPL output testing. This is just trying to figure out what the actual frequency response of these subwoofers are. Now, all of these subwoofers were tested with the exact same input signal which is 0.5 volts RMS provided via the balanced XLR connection. So all of these tests were ran the exact same way. You are comparing apples to apples directly. Starting off with the 10 inch, what we can see here is I have the ported and the sealed comparison. The sealed is the green and the red, I should say, the red and the green, and a variant of the EQ ability of extended or THX is noted down here. So the red is extended and the green is THX. So you can see actually in this case, the extension doesn't really help much here. The THX version has a more smooth uh, profile and a better roll off feature. And then if you go to the ported, which is the purple and the orange, you can see that naturally you do get some more output. And again, the THX is the better linear response. Now you'll also notice too, as you go higher in frequency above 200 Hertz or so, you run into some internal resonances displayed here by the peak and then the following dip. And that's in the ported configuration, but that's high enough in frequency that you're probably not gonna be anywhere near it. Some people will run their subwoofers higher than 100 Hertz. Uh, some people do not, but I doubt many people are gonna run it up to 200 Hertz or more. So you're probably not gonna have an issue with any ringing or anything like that in your setup. But the final note here is that the overall response is actually pretty linear, uh, especially if you go with the ported set. I mean, that that's really quite good. You're within a plus or minus a maybe 2 dB, if, if even that, maybe plus or minus 1 dB for the ported uh, THX mode. Now we're going to go to the 12 inch. Well, actually, I take that back. Now we're going to look at the comparison of my previous budget 10 inch subwoofer winner, which I declared the winner as the ELAC Sub 1010. Now the price on that subwoofer is about 130 bucks on Amazon. Uh, it's gone up a little bit since I posted the video, but it comes back down time and time again. So we're gonna look at that now. What you can see with that in the green is the ELAC definitely has a bump in the output and then a drastic sharp fall off below about 60 Hertz or so. And really what the ELAC and the other budget 10 inch, maybe even 12 inch subwoofers are going to get you is just mid bass. They're going to give you that punch, but they're not going to give you the low frequency content. And that's extremely evident in the graphic that we're seeing here. So in terms of subwoofers, the Monolith 10 at about three times the price of the ELAC has much more linear output, much more output on the low frequency response, even below 50 Hertz, certainly below 30 Hertz. And if you have the money, this, indicates that you would definitely want to get something like the Monolith 10, not a budget 10 inch subwoofer. And if you're restricted to budget money, then yeah, you can get a mid base module is what I'll call them. But keep in mind, it's really interesting to note how much you get in the performance uh, when you pay a little bit more money. And you can see it's very evident that the previous rounds winner uh, for 130 bucks just can't hold a candle to a $500 good subwoofer. All right, now I think we're gonna move on to the 12 inch and I'm gonna leave this here for a little bit. You're more than welcome to pause the video, 
But what we're seeing here is the same kind of trends. Now I tested the subwoofer. This 12 inch comes with two ports. I tested it with one port open and then with both ports open as well as the sealed variant. And that is represented by P1 is one port open and P2 is two ports open. So again, make sure to pause the video if you want to and you can check out more of this data here. I don't have the time to go through all the details right now. But the bottom line, what I'm seeing here is the full open ported with both ports open. The linear or the response is really quite linear. It's really, really good. Even the sealed response is really good. And yeah, now we're gonna to step to a version with comparing the Monoprice Monolith 12 to the Monoprice Budget 12 inch. Now that Budget 12 inch is a $99 subwoofer. And again, look at the difference in what you're getting. If you go to 30 Hertz, you're at about, what is this, 84 dB. And then you go to 96, 97 dB. So you're gaining about 13 dB for, oh, this is almost eight times the price. So that's, that's hard to, to swallow when you're saying it out loud, but SPL is hard to get. Low frequency SPL does not come free. It's not cheap. You need power, you need excursion. And then combining that with efficiency is tough. It's Hoffman's iron law. You're not gonna get all three, you're gonna get two of the three. And in this case, again, this shows you what you get when you buy a budget subwoofer versus what you get when you buy what I'm gonna call a real subwoofer. So it's just something to keep in mind, okay? Now, moving on to the 15 inch. Now, the 15 inch comes with three ports. And I tested one port open, two ports open, three ports open, but I'm not providing it here because it would be a nightmare for you to see. And you can just kind of mentally interpolate between the results here. So the sealed naturally is a little bit lower in response than the ported version. And the ported version buys you about maybe five dB in output and more than that at 20 Hertz. So the ported version is probably gonna be what most people go with for the home theater type setting. Now, if you're listening to just music, there's not a lot of musical content below 30 Hertz in most music. Now, obviously there's some, but you know, if you're looking for just music, then yeah, you could rock it with the sealed and probably decrease the overall group delay, which may or may not be an issue. I did measure it, but I don't have the time to cover it in this video because honestly, I don't put a lot of stock into it unless you're talking about group delay, which is time transient at the crossover region and then it matters. But in this case, none of these have a large group delay at the typical crossover region of 80 to 100 Hertz. So I'm not gonna waste my time discussing it. And that's gonna be it for my frequency response. Now let's skip over to my max SPL testing. Now, my max SPL testing can be reached at a link which I will provide in the description below. And you can see a table of all my results thus far. The max SPL testing, the purpose of this is to determine the maximum SPL the subwoofer is capable of at varying frequencies. And it is based on different distortion thresholds. So thresholds. So there is a CEA 2010A and a CEA 2010B test. I have both of those provided here. I discuss what they are in this document. But the bottom line, what you'll want to know is these monoprice monolith subwoofers all get quite loud. They have a lot of output for their for their price. Now I'm not gonna say for their size because they're big old subwoofers, relatively speaking, if you compare it to you know more budget affiliated type speakers, then yeah, it's, it's gonna change things. And speaking of the word affiliation, on the left-hand column, these are hyperlinks to uh, affiliates of mine. So like Amazon, or I recently uh, got an affiliate account with Monoprice so I could help kind of offset my costs um, if you wanted to buy one of these subwoofers through my affiliate links. Now, it doesn't cost you any more money. It gets me about two to 6%, depending on you know time of day. I don't know the weird stuff. So it's not like I'm getting rich off of this stuff. I'm not quitting my job, but it's something that I think everybody should know. You know, when you click through that link, it is an affiliate link. So if you don't want to provide me with any affiliation type help, um, then don't click through that link. But it does definitely help me buy other speakers to test, buy the hardware that I've got to use to test and all that stuff. So. Keep that in mind. Um, a lot of people aren't honest about that and I wanna be honest with you. So keep that in mind. Now, if you wanna to go to my SPL tabs, you can see the levels. So the Monoprice 15 uh, at 40 Hertz gets 122 dB. That's pretty dang loud uh, at, let's see, 25 Hertz, 115 dB. That's pretty dang loud. And then if you go and compare it to something like, you know, my budget Monoprice 12 inch, uh, 25 Hertz, 90 dB. And then if you go and find the Monoprice 12, 110 dB, the Monolith 12 is 110 dB versus 90 dB. 
So that's 20 dB in extra output that you can get on in terms of max output capability. So obviously you're getting your money's worth when you're talking about spending extra money on a mono price monolith subwoofer or you know another one of those um, more well-regarded subwoofers. You know if you're if you're spending more than a few hundred bucks, likely you're going to get more performance, and we're certainly seeing that with a mono price subwoofers. And that's going to do it for my objective testing for my Max SPL. Let's talk about let's talk about something else. In my listening experiences with all of these subwoofers uh, in either home theater mode or music mode, I never had any, any issues that I noticed, but it's always worth it to go the extra step and provide you guys with a demonstration of what I mean. So in order to provide that demonstration, I'm going to run through an exercise that I like to do on my own. And it's just a check for those kind of external noises. Any noise that the subwoofer shouldn't be generating, such as a resonance from the enclosure, the tensile lead slap, or the port chuffing. And in order to do that, it's really quite simple. I hook it up to my computer, I run our Room EQ Wizard, so REW, and I just set a generator for sine tones, and I just walk through some frequencies, and I try to listen to for, and I try to listen to noises. And when I hear something, I'll make a note of it, and then I'll try to listen back in music and things like that. And say, is it really? as much of a problem when I'm listening to music as it is when I'm listening to it through a straight sine sweep or a sine wave tone or something like that. And in the monolith case, I never had an issue, but I'm still going to demonstrate for you what I'm doing when I'm doing that additional testing. So I've got everything hooked up to Rumi Q Wizard as you can see here. I'm going to start with 120 hertz and I'm going to work my way down in frequency, okay? Obviously, it's, it's less an output at 73 hertz. I'm going to stop it there for a second. Now, starting at 120 or 110, whatever I was just at, and working down to where I'm at right now, there was no resonances. That's a great thing. It's, it's not uncommon at all for a, uh, a poor subwoofer to have those kind of issues, and you would hope that you don't get that when you're paying $500 or more for these kind of subwoofers. And in all of these cases, I'm not having any higher frequency resonances show up in that typical crossover region. So that's a good thing. Now, I also want to note too that this is my office space. So there's naturally going to be some reflections. There's about to be some windows rattling, some those kind of noises. And just try to ignore those because that's not coming from the subwoofer itself. So here we go. At about 30, I can hear a little bit more influence from the port. It's not bad. It's not, you know, hair raising or anything like that, but it is a little bit more noticeable. And it's kind of interesting to kind of put things in perspective. We're going to do this. Okay. So it's not moving a whole lot there, but let's see what happens when I get down to 25. Ah, there it is. So the port is definitely taking over. Now, all that rattling, believe it or not, is actually my, my windows. Um, I don't know how you would fix that in a home theater. I guess you, can you just sound dead in windows? I don't know, put concrete over them. But the point here is that even though there's all these room noises um, and the port is definitely doing its thing by moving a whole lot of air, there's not a lot of port chuff. There's no noticeable port chuff that's taking away from the quality of the subwoofer's output. And this is only the 10 inch version. The 12 and the 15 inch versions actually even do better in that regard. And you would expect them to because they're larger, they have more internal air space, they have the capability to move air because they're a larger surface diameter. So you've got those things going for it as well. But the 10 inch is great, just as I demonstrated here. And the 12 and 15 inch, I, I had no issues with either of those either. Bottom line, I can wholeheartedly recommend these speakers. I think they are a fantastic value. They have a lot of Output, objectively speaking, subjectively speaking, there was no issues in either home theater use or music use. The 10, the 12, and the 15 inch are all great subwoofers. It just depends on how much output you're wanting. As we saw in the data, the 15 inch just beats a snot out of the 12 and the 10 inch, but the 10 and the 12 inch beat the snot out of the budget 10 and 12 inch out there that we see like on Amazon and stuff like that. I mean, 
those budget subwoofers that are, you know, the hundred to maybe $300 range are basically mid bass modules. And if you want response below 50 Hertz, you're going to, have to pay up a little bit more and you're going to, have to get something like this. Now these do not come in like a gloss black and that's actually where you're going to save money. So if you're looking for something that's really shiny to kind of show off to your friends or fits a nice aesthetic in your home for whatever reason, then you're going to pay more money. I mean, you're probably talking $300 or more to get something like that kind of finish. But if you're just looking for raw value for your money, the monolith subwoofers definitely have that in folds. I can't tell you honestly for sure that they are the best value out there because frankly, I haven't tested a lot of other subwoofers, but I can tell you that they are a great value on their own and I would recommend them if you were looking for something in this price range. Now, I do also like the fact that it has the variable phase. To me, that's that's worth that's worth a lot of money. I mean, that really literally is the difference in you having a okay sound system or a fantastic sound system. So if you're factoring in that to the equation, that's certainly a, a nice feature that these incorporate. And then you've got the unbalanced inputs, but also the balanced XLR inputs, which is a nice feature to have as well. So bottom line, I recommend these subwoofers. If you're interested in getting them, uh, great. If you don't mind helping me out, maybe try to purchase them through my affiliate link. But if you don't like doing affiliate stuff, then you can just get them straight off their website. No harm. And if you don't mind, I would appreciate it if you could kind of share this video with your friends. Give me a thumbs up, give me a like and all that good stuff because that helps me grow this channel. That helps me give the word out about objective performance and how these things perform because there's a lot of junk out there, but there's also a lot of good stuff out there that deserves to be highlighted. So I'm doing the best I can. If you appreciate it, give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment suggesting what you're looking forward to seeing next. And maybe I can try to figure something out and, and work that into my upcoming tests. So you guys take care. Again, I appreciate you watching. Have a good one. Peace.